Hey everyone, welcome to Christ Community Church. My name is Keegan and I am so excited that you're here today, especially if you're new. We know that being in a new place with all kinds of new people can be a little intimidating, so we wanna give you an idea of what to expect during our time together. In a few moments, our music teams are going to lead us singing a few songs, and then later in our service, we're going to hear a great message from our lead pastor, Mark Ashton. Before we get started, check out what's happening this week at CCC. For the next several months, everyone at CCC is going on an exciting spiritual journey by reading through the entire narrative portions of the Bible in a series called The Story. In case you're new and just hearing about this, you can still jump in. Copies of the story along with other great story resources, including companion guides and the story for kids, they're all at our resource booth. And if you're new, you can get your copy of the story for free. It's our gift to you. On Sunday, October 21st, we are having a special baby dedication service for moms and dads in our CCC family who are choosing to raise their kids in a Christian home. These special services happen every couple of months and you can find out more online. Imagine this, get a phone call from Regis. He says, do you want to be a millionaire? I was a dead man who was called to come out of my way. I think it's time for making some noise. Wake the neighbors. Stephen Curtis Chapman, one of the most influential voices in Christian music over the past 20 years, is going to be here at CCC in concert on November 17th. You can purchase tickets online or we have a limited number available at the resource booth in the atrium. And one more thing, we know that sometimes life can be hard and maybe you're here today and you have something heavy that you're walking through. Well, each week at CCC, we have a team of people ready to pray with you and for you in our prayer room. And at any time today, you're invited to follow the signs to the prayer room and someone will be there for you. Service is about to begin. Once again, thank you for joining us today. We're so glad you're here. For more info about anything we've talked about today or today's message, be sure to go online at cccomaha.info. Now, if you excuse me, Stephen and I got a jam. Live out loud, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, good morning, everyone. Oh, it's good to see you. Been looking forward to this morning. Let's rise our together, everyone, and we're going to sing, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. Oh, guide me. I
songs of praises, songs of praises I will ever give to thee. May that be the attitudes of our hearts today as we come together to worship. Well, welcome to everyone. So glad that you're here today. If you're visiting with us, thanks for being here this morning. We trust you've already been warmly greeted and uh, that you will come back and be with us again in the weeks ahead. Well, last week we talked just a little bit about um, the Hurricane Florence and it came through the Carolinas and all the devastation that we saw and we are well aware there are still those that are struggling and suffering and, and coming through um, all of the, uh, the damage that was done by that hurricane and we have an opportunity to participate. Our denomination uh, has a, a, a part of the ministry that just works especially in helping in situations like this and so if you would like to give towards uh, Florence and to help our churches in that area to reach out and to minister and to assist you can write a check and just in the memo you can write Florence and it will get to where it's supposed to go and I think we also have a telephone number up here and you can text to that telephone number an amount and that will get to where it needs to go too so I trust that we will uh, be generous in our giving and assist those who need our help right now in uh, especially in the Carolina uh, area well before we continue today why don't you turn and uh, greet those around you and say good morning to someone You can be seated. You can be seated. Well, we all have the, uh, the ability to talk about God's goodness and his, his faithfulness because of our knowledge of God and what we find about him in his word. But there's a difference um, when those same words, goodness and faithfulness, are spoken from experience. Amen? Experience. And we have one who is coming this morning, and uh, she is going to sing a song of testimony. And um, she comes not only knowing about God's faithfulness and goodness, but she has experienced it. She's experienced it. And uh, Shelley, uh, come. And Shelley and her family have walked a hard path with God. For those of you who know Shelley and her family, she um, lost a, uh, a dear uh, daughter, and um, there was a near fatal car accident where another beautiful daughter um, uh, was in that accident, and uh, there was a long rehabilitation following and then Shelley come Shelley uh, this past year uh, endured uh, a long journey of a cancer diagnosis and treatment but she stands here today cancer free praise the Lord <laughs> yeah yeah and she would be the first to say um, that she did not walk the road perfectly. She wanted me to tell you that. She has not walked the road perfectly. But she today can stand before you and say with all of her heart and uh, all she's endured that still I will trust him. Still I will trust him.
It is so good to have her back in the music ministry. We missed her so much. And uh, Shelly, thanks for sharing your story this morning. Let's rise and respond with great, great is thy faithfulness. Let's sing from our hearts.
God our help in ages past and hope for years to come. Our God, our God in ages past, our hope for years to come. Our shelter from the stormy blast and our eternal home. Under the shadow of thy throne, still may we dwell secure. Sufficient is thy arm alone, and our defense is shown. Faithful in all that lies behind us, and faithful in all that waits before. This our peace and strong assurance, and for the faithful, faithful Lord, for the faithful, faithful Lord. Faithful in all that lies behind us, faithful in all that waits before. This our peace and strong assurance, you're the faithful, faithful Lord. You're the faithful, faithful Lord. You're the Let's pray the Lord's Prayer together this morning. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Hi, good morning, Christ Community Church. My soul is full. It has been so good to be reminded again of the faithfulness of God. Hey, you know what? Every Sunday we come here, and regardless of all the differences... That, that we have amongst each other, we share something in common, and that's that we come to give the only one who is worthy of our worship praise and to turn our affection to him. And uh, I, I have been so blessed this morning already, so thank you. Thank you, Steve, and your, your team. Um, I want to especially welcome those who are new with us today. Thanks for being here. And uh, this is a time where we can, one, gather together and sing like we have been doing. It's also another time where we can gather together and give because we have a need to give back that which God has so blessed us with. And so if you came uh, prepared to give today, we have envelopes in front, and you can stick a cash or check in there. And there are drop boxes in the back by the door, so you can drop that off. I know some of you uh, give online, and that's great, too. It's an uh, intentional way for you to kind of uh, monitor your giving and frequency, so that's an option for you as well. But regardless, thank you for partnering with our church. Hey, there's a world out there that needs the hope and love of Jesus. And uh, we also need the hope and love of Jesus, don't we? And so this is an opportunity for us to gather together um, and, and praise God and worship him through giving. Hey, for those of you who are new and our guests today, uh, we know this is a big place. We want to give you a chance to get connected, to take some next steps. Also, those of you who have been coming here for a while, there's a card also in, your, uh, in front of your seat called the Next Step card. I invite you to, to pull that out and to fill it out. And um, maybe if this is your first day, you just want to meet some friendly faces and find out more about our church, you can do that in the Next Step booth area. And we even have a free gift for you. Uh, perhaps you want to learn more about what it means 
means to be a disciple. And our foundations class would be a good opportunity for you. Another wonderful way to get connected here is to serve and to join other people in doing that. And guess what? You have an incredible opportunity this coming Sunday, a week from today, to serve our city. And it is called Citywide Serve. And uh, so it's September 30th. And we are, we are trusting God for at least 500 volunteers to join together and to bless the area that we've adopted in North O called Village One. And it's our annual serving opportunity we were, where we mow lawns and we clean up the neighborhoods and we meet people and we point them to Mission Church and say we love them and, and uh, we invite them to a block party. So if that's something you want to be a part of, sign up. And there's an area in the atrium called um, the, the city, Citywide Serve area booth. Sorry if I'm getting that a little mixed up. Uh, we also have some pretty snazzy shirts. I didn't put one on this morning, but trust me, they are. And uh, if you want to get a shirt and join in on that, um, lunch included, it's $10. Um, so you can sign up there. And also, if you, you get uh, more than two of those in your family, then, you know, just five bucks and, and you can get your shirt and your lunch. And uh, we never want finances to be a, a barrier. So please jump in and uh, be with us. And my journey group, this is a great opportunity for journey groups to serve. So we've already adopted a project and we'll be painting uh, a basement in one of our lighthouses. And I'm excited to be able to join uh, some friends and serve in that way. Well, hey, we have another really good opportunity I want you to get on your calendars. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, sometimes you can get rung up in the... Um, the, the busyness and chaos of life, huh? Yeah? And uh, if we're not careful, our souls get neglected. And we have an opportunity coming up called the Soul Care Conference for you to hit pause on your life and pay attention to your soul. And uh, Dr. Terry Wardle is going to be here October 22nd, I'm sorry, October 26th and 27th. It's a Friday night and Saturday. And uh, he has a story of how God has brought him kind of out of the pit of emotional crashing. And uh, God has given him a ministry out of that. And one of his main premises is this. All around the world, people are going to tell you, especially in culture, that you're not enough. Have you felt that before? That you just don't cut it? Well, he's going to come in this conference and, again, share with us the truth that only Jesus can fulfill our core longings, our longings for love and acceptance and security. And so if that hits a button with you today and you're like, oh, I could really use that um, on the identity of who you have in Jesus, that conference is for you. So uh, it's $49 for the weekend. Again, uh, we have financial assistance uh, available to you if that's a, if that's a, um, a challenge. Uh, soul care conference.com is where you can sign up for that, and uh, we're really looking forward to sharing that with you. Um, in a second, we have Pastor Mark coming up with our next uh, message on chapter 6, wanderings. Y'all been in a period of wandering before? Yes, laughter tells me you have, so I'm eager to hear his message. We have a video to set up um, the overview of where we're at in the story, so draw your attention to, to the screens in a second. I'm just going to invite Jesus in now through prayer. God, thank you for this time together. Thank you that your presence is here. We need you. We love you. And uh, please speak through Mark. Give him power as he speaks our message today. In your name I pray. Amen. As the Israelites journeyed through the desert, they began to complain. They were tired of eating manna and wanted meat like they had when they were slaves in Egypt. Frustrated by their complaining, God gave the Israelites exactly what they wanted. A huge wind blew an enormous flock of quail right into their camp. They had so much quail that it took them two days to collect it all. They spread the quail out, but before they could consume it, God sent a plague that killed those who asked for meat. The Israelites continued their journey toward the Promised Land. They came to the outskirts of a city called Canaan. Moses sent spies ahead to see if the city was a good place to live and how tough the battle might be to take it over. 
The spies came back and told him the land was amazing, flowing with milk and honey and all kinds of fruit. But the people living there were huge, like giants, and that it would be impossible to defeat them. But two of the spies, Joshua and Caleb, told the Israelite leaders they should go into Canaan because God was on their side. The leaders refused, becoming so angry at Joshua and Caleb that they almost executed them because the Israelites didn't believe that God would help them. God sent them to wander in the desert for 40 years. In the desert, the Israelites were having trouble finding water and began to complain. So God told Moses to speak to a rock and water would flow from it. Moses obeyed God, but only partly, even though God had told Moses to strike a rock for water before, God told Moses to only speak to it this time. But Moses disobeyed and struck it anyway. God wasn't happy with Moses' lack of trust and punished him by allowing him to see the promised land, but not enter it. Moses was getting pretty old and looked for someone to take over for him as leader. He chose Joshua. Just before he died, Moses stood before the entire nation of Israel and told them the story of how God had promised land to Abraham, freed them from slavery in Egypt, and had even given them commands to live by as God's special people. When he finished, Moses climbed a nearby mountain. God showed him all of the promised land, and Moses died. All right, well, good morning, family. Good morning to those who are joining us online and in the student center as well. And uh, today uh, we're tackling chapter 6 in the story. Now, if you happen to be new or visiting with us, the story is this little book that we're going through that takes the narrative portions of the Bible and puts it together little story by little story, uh, what we call the lower story, in order to give us a picture of what God's doing in this world, something that we call the upper story. This week we read through chapter 6, which is all about wanderings in the desert, and we were able to follow the Israelites as they went from place to place through what mostly is in the Bible is the book of Numbers. Now, Numbers is one of the worst titled books in the entire Bible because it only appeals to accountants and actuaries. Everybody else is like, avoid that book. Uh, Let me tell you the reason why it's called the book of Numbers. This isn't all in the story, but if you were reading the book of Numbers, it would be there. At the beginning of the book of Numbers, it starts with a census, okay? So they're counting all of the people. They've gone to this little town in the desert called Kadesh Barnea. They've invaded that town because it's an oasis in the middle of the desert in order to be able to count up all the people. In fact, one of the ways of remembering a mnemonic device to remember the theme of the book of Numbers is counting the faces at the Kadesh Oasis. Isn't that cute? (laughs) So we're counting the faces at the Kadesh Oasis. They count 603,000 people at the beginning of the book. And then the most of the book goes through their wanderings in the middle of the desert for nearly 40 years. And at the end of the book, there's another census where they talk about every, all the people from all the different tribes. And at the end, there's 601,000 people. So the bottom line is there's about the same number of people at the beginning of the book as there is at the end of the book. But in between these two parts, the beginning and the end, God is doing a transformational work in the Israelites. Because during that time, everybody who was over 20 years old at the beginning dies in the desert, and God raises up a new generation. Sometimes they die just through natural causes, sometimes through judgment, sometimes through battles, but they all die in the wilderness, and they get to the end, and they have a new generation of people. And we ask ourselves the question, what is God doing in the years, these 38 or 40 years that they're wandering in the desert, what's God doing? Well, what God is doing is he's creating a people with a new identity. He's moving people from being people who have a slave mentality to people who have a freedom mentality. He's taking people from being those who bowed to the gods of Egypt and only understood the world through the paradigm of idolatry 
to becoming people who understand the world through the paradigm of God's providence. A new generation that's learned to trust him. And sometimes it's just true that God takes us into the wilderness so that we might learn how to trust him. Isn't that the case? God takes us into the wilderness so that we might learn how to trust him. And so God takes the people of God into the wilderness so that this new general generation will be raised up. And if you read through it all, what you'll find is that there's at least five different episodes in the book of Numbers where there's a pattern of complaining and rebellion, judgment, mercy, and transformation. So for me today, instead of unpacking all five of those, just let you know that happens over and over, and we're just going to unpack one of them. It happens on page 72 and 73 of the story, or Numbers chapter 11 in your Bibles, if you want to turn and follow along while we talk. But before we do, let me show you where we are on a map. So here's a map of uh, what it looked like during the time. All right, and you guys may remember last week we were down at Mount Sinai where that red lambda-looking, mountain-looking thing is. And this week we're right in the middle of the Sinai Peninsula where the arrow is pointing. And I just want to ask a couple of things about this. Now, you know that they came out of Egypt, which is that area directly to the left, and the place that they lived, what color would you say is the place that they lived? It's the color? Green. It's green, yeah. And then if you go around the Mediterranean Sea up to the right a little bit, there's the area that's at the time called Canaan. We now call it Israel. And uh, that place, the color is? Green. green. But where they are in this story, it's very, very brown, isn't it? This is what we call the land between. And the land between is not only a geographic place or a position in Israel's history, the land between is also a metaphor. It's a metaphor for where God takes us in life sometimes. And you can actually feel what it's like at different points in your life to be in the land between. Some of you are going to be able to identify right away, that's where I am right now. I'm in the land between. But I want to tell you, if you are not in the land between right now, you're headed there eventually. Because all of us wind up in the land between for at least a part of our lives. And if we want to become a people that are a people beyond belief, right? Because we don't want to be ordinary followers of Jesus. We don't want to be mediocre Americans. We want to be people who are beyond belief. And because of that, we have to learn how to navigate life in the desert in order to be able to become the people that God wants us to become. Now, the land between happens at different times for different people. And uh, I want to give a little bit of credit here because uh, I got a, a, quite a bit of information about this message from this book called The Land Between uh, by Jeff Mannion, a pastor who is in uh, Michigan. He did a great job with this. But someone might be in the land between. Imagine a college student who's had the luxury for four years of living off of student loans and being able to answer the question, what are you doing with your life, by saying, I'm a classics major. I'm a classics major. I'm a classics major. And then comes that terrible, awful, very bad day called graduation, <laughs> where you realize you've got $80,000 in student loans, and the only job you can find is a job at The Gap the same job you had in high school before you went to college. If that's the case for you, welcome to the land between. The land between is full of phrases that begin with the words, for now. You know, for now, I'm working at the gap. For now, I'm living in my parents' basement. The land between could also be somebody who used to cheer for a football team that went for national championships year <laughs> after year after year. I know we're all grieving. We're all grieving together this week. The land between could be somebody who went to work last week hoping to put together a brilliant marketing campaign for the next run of business, but instead wound up in the HR manager's office finding out that he's been downsized. Welcome to the land between. The land between is filled with phrases like a doctor saying, I'm sorry, I have bad news. 
police officer who says, I'm sorry, there's been an accident. I remember one time, before we had kids, my pregnant wife was in the next room and I could hear her crying. I went in to check on her and I saw that there was pain and I saw there was some blood. And I knew exactly what was happening because it already happened once that year. We were losing our second baby in a row. Mark, welcome to the land between, where I was asking questions like, will we ever be able to have children? In the land between, we find ourselves in isolation. Depression seems to last longer. Prayers seem to be unanswered. I don't know if you have ever been there, but God does deep work in the land between. And if you're there right now, I'm convinced that he wants to do a deep work inside of you. Well, the Israelites are there in the land between. They're at Kadesh Barnea, and there's 600,000 people in the middle of the desert, which should make us ask the big question, how did they eat? I mean, 600,000 people in the middle of the desert is an extreme amount of people are there. How did they eat? Well, they asked the question, God, will you provide for us to eat? And every day, God provided this white, flaky substance that they had never recognized before. In fact, the first morning that it showed up, they got out of their tents and looked on the ground and they said, what is it? And the stuff that was on the ground is called manna, which is Hebrew for, what is it? (laughs) So they start with this manna stuff and they ground it up with pestle and they make it into cakes and they have manna for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And the next day, they have manna for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. They have manna cakes. They have manna souffle. Manna a la mode, manna sandwiches, manna cereal, manna burgers. (laughs) Every day, it's manna again. Are you sick of this yet? Well, imagine how sick of it they became day after day eating manna. I want to read to you their response to all of the manna eating that they got to do in the middle of the desert. This is on page 72. The rabble with them began to crave other food again. And the Israelites started wailing and they said, If only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. And also the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But we've lost our appetite. We never see anything but this, what is it? (laughs) The Israelites complain and they are yearning for Egypt. You know, you may think that in the land between, in the desert, there's not much that uh, grows. But I'm convinced that the desert is fertile ground for at least four different things, and one of those things is it's fertile ground for complaint. Somebody say complaint. Complaint. When you're in the middle of the desert, it's easy to complain, and you might think that the people of Israel, after seeing the hand of God at work, after watching the ten plagues and the Passover, after escaping Pharaoh's army, going through the Red Sea, going up on the top of Mount Sinai, experiencing the hand of God, downloading the Ten Commandments, that they would never, ever rebel or complain again. But it's just not the case. In fact, instead of approaching them with a little bit of judgment, it might be wiser for us to approach them with some humility. Humility. And say, given the same set of circumstances, I could really see myself in that place. Because have you ever eaten the same food over and over and over again? Like ramen noodles in college, anybody do that? Macaroni and cheese when you first got married. It gets old really, really fast. Now I want to point out that the people of Israel do not just complain about the cafeteria plan. Instead, what they're doing is they're yearning for the days back in Egypt. We wish we could go back to Egypt and experience what we experienced there. And it's amazing how often when we remember the past, we remember all of the good things and forget the difficulties. 
Have you ever noticed that human tendency that's there? We look on the past with rose-colored glasses. I wish I could go back there. For the Israelites, I wish I could go eat the cucumbers and the leeks, but they forget we were in slavery back there. But there's something way bigger that they're forgetting. Now, in the middle of the desert, they have the very presence of God in the midst of them, who lives in their camp, and shows up as a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And by saying we want to go back to Egypt, essentially they're saying we were better off without you, God. Before you called us out of that place, we were better off without you in our midst. Which takes complaining to an entirely different level. People of Israel thinking their lives were better without God. Well, let me ask this about your life. Have you ever said that? In essence, I want to go back to Egypt. Life when I was giving myself over to fill in the blank. I kind of yearn for that. For the days of my addiction. For the days when I was sleeping around. For the days before I had all of these people that I was trying to care for at this point. That kind of complaining is the same kind of complaining against God that we say, God, I was better off when I was without you in my life. See, the land between is fertile ground for complaint. And I have some news for you if you didn't know this. Leaders, even spiritual leaders, sometimes say the same thing. Because spiritual leadership is never easy. Even for guys like Moses. I mean, Moses was the rock. He was unshakable. He's an example in the Bible of an amazing spiritual leader. Yet this even broke Moses. Here's what Moses said in response to the people complaining about the food. It says this. He asked the Lord, why have you brought this trouble on your servant? Now listen to all the I, me, I, me in here with Moses. What have I done to displease you, to put the burden of all these people on me? Did I conceive all these people? Did I give them birth? Why do you tell me to carry them in my arms as a nurse carries an infant to the land you promised on earth to their ancestors? Where can I get meat for all these people? They keep wailing to me, give us meat to eat. I cannot carry all these people by myself. The burden is too heavy for me. Moses is entering into the land of complaint in the midst of the desert. And I love the childcare imagery here. Did I conceive these people? Did I give them birth? God, I did not ask for this job. Why do I have to carry them through the desert? And for Moses, this is not like just carrying an infant through the desert. This is like carrying a tractor through the desert. 600,000 people that are the burden that he has to carry. And he's feeling awfully alone. In fact, I find that the land between is not only fertile ground for complaint, it's also fertile ground for emotional meltdown. Somebody say emotional meltdown. Because this is really what's happening with Moses. And if you don't believe me, just read the next line that's right here. Moses says, if this is how you're going to treat me, please go ahead and kill me. If I found favor in your eyes, and do not let me face my own ruin. In other words, he's saying, God, if you love me, kill me now. (laughs) I'd really like out of this leadership responsibility. And you know what I love about Moses in this moment is I love the honesty I love that he feels like when he's in the middle of an emotional meltdown, he can come to God in prayer. He doesn't run away from God. He's not embarrassed to say what's really on his mind. In fact, I think in this, Moses is a model for the rest of us. Wherever you're at, even in the middle of emotional meltdown, bring it to God and pray. Because I see what's happening in Moses' life in the life of business leaders and spiritual leaders. I see it in the eyes of a small business leader who I know, who said, I don't know what to do with my business. Three years ago, we were in the black and we were thriving. But since then, it's just dried up. And I've cut costs and I've cut the fringy stuff. I've even cut a couple of staff and I'm just not making payroll week to week. I see it in the eyes of a camp director 
who's staring at a list. 14 names that he's got to call today. 14 phone calls that he never wanted to make. Because he runs a camp where there was a 23-year-old counselor who got involved with a 16-year-old camper, and now there's a pregnancy. And he's got to call parents and some board members and some big donors to explain the situation. And sometimes in spiritual leadership, it's just a ripe pot for emotional meltdown. And it happens to almost every spiritual leader that I know, that there's a certain point in your leadership where you say, God, why didn't you just make me the flower delivery guy? Because everybody loves the flower delivery guy, right? Every time he shows up, I'd love to do that job. But the land between is not just fertile ground for complaint and emotional meltdown. It's also fertile ground for provision. Everybody say provision. You see, God loves to take us to a point of desperation so that he can show us how many ways he wants to provide for us. Manna is one of those key ways that God provides for his people. Every day they ask the question, where are we going to get food today? Where are we going to get food today? And every day they open the door of their tent and there's the manna. God provides it for them. Enough for one day. Because part of the manna deal is if you collect more than for one day, overnight it's going to rot. God wanted to provide for them enough for today. And then tomorrow he wanted to provide for them enough for today. And the next day he provided enough for them for today. And he was training the emerging generation that you can trust me, you can trust me, you can trust me every single day. And perhaps this is the very foreshadowing of the words that we pray in the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day. We don't pray, God, give us enough for a week or a month or for the rest of my retirement. Just, God, give us enough for this day. And we ask God to provide for us on a daily basis. That's one of the pictures of provision here. Another picture of provision is that God provides for Moses people who will carry the burden with him. That he does not have to do this alone. It says this in Numbers 16, 11, 16, and 17. says, The Lord said to Moses, Bring me 70 of Israel's elders who are known to you as leaders and officials among the people. Have them come to me to the tent of meeting that they may stand there with you. I'll come down and speak with you there and I'll take some of the power of the spirit that's on you and I'll put it on them and they will share the burden of the people with you so that you will not have to carry it alone. So God meets Moses at the tent of meeting, says, bring 70 of your guys, and you can share the load with these 70 people. The Spirit of God goes on them. I love how God says they will carry the burden with you. He uses Moses' own word about carrying the infant through the wilderness. He says, I'll put my spirit on them, and they will help share the load with you. This is one of the biggest reasons why we say, family, we've got to be in journey groups. We've got to be in community We've got to meet not just in rows where we worship Jesus, but in circles where we're in community, where we love each other and share each other's burdens. Because part of the way that God provides for us in the wilderness is with the community that he's given us, a community that loves us. You see, God really is gracious and he really wants to provide to the burned out, to the fried, to People with open hands, God longs to provide for you. For someone who's unemployed, he may provide a job. Or sometimes he provides for contentment with what you already have. Or sometimes it's the strength to send out one more resume or make one more phone call. For the person with depression, sometimes you're delivered from that depression. Sometimes you're given the strength to handle it or a community and friends that will journey with you through the middle of it. Sometimes God's provision is when you show up at church and there is this eerily timed sermon that you go, how did God know what was going on in my life for that message that hit my heart today? I want you to know today we believe that God wants to provide. And in a few minutes when the message is over, we're going to invite people to come down to the front. And I've got some of my friends, elders, pastors, prayer warriors, 
that are going to be down here in the front that would love to pray over you for God's provision. If you're somebody who is in the land between, we're going to invite you to ask God boldly for his provision for your life because God wants to provide. And sometimes God provides adequately, and sometimes God provides way more than anything you could ever ask or imagine. So we should ask him for these things. For example, with the Israelites, he provided way more than what they were asking. Go down to verse 18. Verse 18 says this. Then Yahweh says to Moses, tell the people this. Consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow when you will... Eat meat. The Lord heard you when you wailed. If only we had meat to eat, we were better off in Egypt. Now Yahweh will give you meat and you will eat it. You will not eat it for just one day or two days or five or 10 or 20 days, but for a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils and you loathe it. Because you have rejected Yahweh who is among you and have wailed before him saying, why did we ever leave Egypt? There it is, my friends, meat coming out the nose right there in the Holy Bible. (laughs) I mean, this is not only a good Bible story, it's great for complaining children at (laughs) mealtime. Ever thought about that? You don't want to eat your broccoli? Daddy's going to tell you a Bible story. (laughs) The children of Israel didn't like their food and it came out their nose. God loves to provide, and sometimes he provides a huge amount, even way more than we need. In this case, the quail come in, the world's largest quail migration happens to come in that next day. And it comes in, not happens to come in, God brought it in. They say two cubits high worth of quail, that's three feet high, filled with quail. I mean, so many that you could pull out your tennis rack and just start popping them out of the air. In fact, it says that the people of Israel gathered 10 homers of quail each. Now, a homer is like a bushel basket. So every single person, 600,000 men, women, and children, each has essentially a pickup bed filled with quail to eat for the next 30 days. I love God's humor and sarcasm in the midst of this, that he brings a huge amount, way more than you could ever imagine. And I think that he creates this comic relief in part to show them that he can always provide whenever he wants, wherever he wants, even quail in the middle of the desert. There is no problem with his ability here. In fact, he says so much in verse 23. The Lord answered Moses, is the Lord's arm too short? Now you'll see whether or not what I say will come true for you. Is God's arm too short to provide, he asks. To Moses, he's saying, are you questioning my ability or my goodness in this? What is it that you think is inadequate in me to provide meat for all of these people? God can provide in better ways than you could ever imagine. And when you're in the middle of the desert, sometimes you ask that question. God, is it even possible for you to do this for me? Maybe the word from God you need to hear today is that same question. Is the Lord's arm too short? Do you think that he has little stubby Tyrannosaurus Rex arms that can't reach where you are? God can provide for you no matter where you are. He has the competence and he has the goodness to do so. But I need to let you know that God's real agenda is not always our comfort. Sometimes God's agenda is our transformation. And I want you to know that the land between the desert is also fertile ground for transformational growth. Someone say transformational growth. (laughs) The land between is the best place, I'm convinced, for people to experience the power of God. God does his deepest work in crisis and not in comfort. God builds desperation and dependency and trust when things are not going well. And he needs the people of Israel to learn to trust them. So he takes them to a place with no food and no water and asks them day after day, will you trust me, will you trust me, will you trust me? Because God knows there is a day coming that they will enter into the promised land 
And they'll hit hard times there as well. And they're going to have to ask the question, when I'm in the promised land, am I going to trust God? Or am I going to run to the temple of Baal? Or am I going to bow at the pole of Asherah? Who am I going to worship? And he wants to mold a community that will work with him in dramatic and revolutionary ways to trust him in battle after battle, situation after situation, and set up a kingdom where the entire generation trusts in him. And so he trains them in the desert. And God's creating and forming those kinds of people right here today, too. You see, the good news of the gospel is that Jesus is not just our Savior who rescues us from our sins and gives us a a brand new life and ticket to heaven. That's all really true. But Jesus is also our healer who intervenes in our life to take the broken places and make them beautiful again. And Jesus is also our sanctifier, whose job is to transform us and make us more and more like Jesus every single day. And Jesus is our coming king, the one who we bow our knees to and say, God, have your way with me. Whatever you want, whatever way you want to provide, I want you to provide. And Jesus as our savior, healer, sanctifier, and coming king is all good news. Amen? Jesus wants to meet us here today. So I'm going to ask you if you want to come forward for prayer in just a moment. I think we learn deep and authentic prayer in the land between. God gives us the chance to change our lives. In fact, there's this phrase in American culture that says, time heals. Fill in the blank for me. Time heals what? Time heals all wounds. It's a lie. I want you to know that phrase is a lie. Because there's some people who go into the land between and they become bitter and angry and poisonous and they just stay there for the rest of their life. There's other people who go into the land between and a beautiful work of change happens inside of them. And they head in a totally different direction and their character becomes beautiful. The land between is where your heart is in jeopardy and you can choose poison or you can choose life. Friends, I'm here today to encourage you to choose life in the land between. It's the land that God invites us into. To trust Jesus as not only your Savior, but your healer, your sanctifier, and your coming King. So we're going to invite prayer to come down in just a minute. Let me give you a few logistics. If you're in the student center right now, I'm going to invite you to come down to the front from the student center. And we'll have some prayer warriors that will be there for you to pray. If you're here in this room, we'll be inviting you right here down to the front. Some of you who are sitting in the middle of the fat section may say, I don't know if I want to step over all the people around me to come down to the front. I want to encourage you, knock people over if you need prayer. Come to the front. Up in the balcony up here, we have just redesigned our balcony with an aisle around the middle so that we invite people to come for healing prayer, you can walk around the edges and down the stairs and come down here. No longer do we have to walk out of the room into the back stairs in order to come back in for prayer. That's good news, isn't it? And so we want people in the balcony and the main floor to feel free to come forward for prayer. Now I'm going to ask everybody in both of our rooms to stand where we're at. Because the wilderness is the best place for growth and transformation to happen. The land between is the soil where God does his richest and deepest work. So if you're facing a medical crisis and you need healing, if you're facing a business crisis and you need provision, if you're facing something that only you and God know about and you just want somebody to be praying with you about that, for goodness sakes, come forward and receive some prayer this morning. The people of God are designed to do this together, to provide for one another through the prayers that God offers us. So I'm going to invite you to come forward right now. If you're somebody who is an elder, you can come forward. If you're somebody who wants prayer, you can go ahead and come forward. Pastors, other people who are ready for prayer, just begin to come forward. And we would love, love, love to be praying over you. And as you walk forward, let me give a prayer for everybody. And then we'll let you pray down here with the person who you need prayer from. God, we invite your power and your provision in these moments. We ask for you to do a mighty work of healing and strength and providing for our people. Come Holy Spirit, do your work we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's come forward now for prayer. Sing with us.
Jesus. still again. Sing of our wonderful, merciful Savior. always 
Let's all bow our heads together. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for the faith of these people who have come forward this morning. And God, I speak for all of us as a church family that you would come in a powerful way and to meet these people and their needs where they are today. Some of these people we know, we care for, and we love. Would you continue to bring them to our minds and we can continue to bring them before you this coming week. You do with all things well. You are a faithful God. In Jesus' name, amen. As a benediction, let's just sing that song one more time. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. And then would you leave quietly this morning? And some of these prayers are going to stay down here. So if you'd like to come down after the service, feel free to come down. One more time, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Jesus.